Welcome to On the Vanguard, Conversations with Women and Non-Binary People of Color in STEM. I am your host, Dr. Anika Harriet, and once again, I am joined by Dr. Geraldine Ezeka and, and Dr. Ariana Long. All right, so when we're not doing all of our science, we're here bringing you these conversations about the expertise and experiences of Black and Indigenous folks in STEM. Um, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If this is not your first time joining us, welcome back. Hope you feel fresh, fly, and funky today. Okay. Mm. All right, so mm. we're going to get into our conversation about Black hair today. I'm mm. so excited about this topic. Mm -hmm. So for some folks who are watching this on our YouTube, it's you know visual media, they can see us in all of our melanated glory. That's true. But for some, it's audio only. So I wanted to start this episode off with a conversation about our hair. Um, not that there is really <laughs> much diversity going on as far as hair goes no. here. Right There's now. There's arguments to be made for diversity. So we'll go down the table. Tell us, I want to know what your hair is like right now. And tell me one of your favorite styles to wear it in, like, of, of all time. Not, you know, as it, in its current state. So we'll start with Dr. Geraldine. I'm not even gonna lie, that is such a hard step question. <laughs> you love it all. I do. Okay, so right now, um, I have my locks braided down, crisscross, and then with uh, lock extensions. Shout out to my sister and my friend Ronke for helping me do my hair. Um, How long are these extensions? These extensions are, I think, 36 inches. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's um, like how tall I, I am. Actually <laughs> I actually almost got 42 inches, mm. but it literally would have gone down to the ground. Like, yeah. these are at my knee, and I'm 5'5". Five five. Yeah. So, yeah. you know what I say, the bigger the hair, the closer to God. <laughs> um, my favorite hairstyles, honestly, all of them, is that an answer? It's okay. I love Afro. Like, I used to have an Afro before I locked my hair, and I loved it. I loved it when she was big. I loved it when she was curly. Mm. Um, I used to make wig afros. I loved my braids. I loved my twists. I loved faux locks, okay? Before I locked my hair, I literally got back to back to back to back faux locks, and then I was like, I might as well just lock this baby up. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> and here we are in the dreadlocks of glory, mm. and I love it. Every hairstyle. Mm. I'm a big fan. Big fan. How long have you had your locks? I've had my locks for... Um, Two and a half going on three years. Okay. Um, they're about shoulder length when they, you know, not extended. <laughs> um, but yeah, shout out to Lock. Shout out to the Lock gang. Yeah, gang gang. Gang gang. <laughs> so for me, Dr. Nika, I also have locks. Um, I've got them right now. They're pulled up my little pineapple head. I've got my bangs down right above my eyebrows. I'm not going to keep getting away with hiding this big forehead behind these bangs for much longer. You keep cutting them. Yeah, you know, it's starting to infringe upon my vision. So you just have to part part these seeds and let that forehead shine. Come on, length. Um, see, my locks are about, I'd say, like, chin length right now. And I have been locked for a little over a year, like a year and two months. Mm -hmm. And let's see, my favorite hairstyle, um, pre-locks. I, I was a box braids girly all the time. I loved it. Little clear beads on the end. Um, it was also like my favorite style as a kid, I feel like. I always get in trouble for the beads, <laughs> shaking around. Um, yeah, what about you, Dr. Law? I am also locked up. We are all <laughs> locked up. And it all kind of happened around the same time. Yeah. Um, so it's been over a year, somewhere in there. Um, right now I'm in a twist out, which I love doing because I was natural for most of my life and wore it out. I didn't. I think it braids and, and cornrows and stuff, but most of the time I wear it naturally. And so sometimes I miss the curl, so I get the little twist out action for the curl. Um, curls I love for the it. Girls. It's curls for the girls. girls. Um, I love it. I think this is like for looks. I um, I love all different hairstyles. I really loved having my big curly hair. It felt like I could take up space. I felt beautiful. It felt like a beautiful line with it. I loved it but it was so much maintenance. Yeah. And so this has been my favorite hairstyle in terms of like, it's convenient and I can do things with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's true. So I mentioned we're gonna talk about black hair today and I wanted to start off with why mm. we're talking about black hair. Mm -hmm. And I think the real answer to that is that it's political. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether we want it to be or not. Come on now. Um, you know, we love our hair. We all have like sort of different maybe positionalities around like our hair and how we show up in spaces. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is that it's political and it has been for a really long time. So 
I wanted to just like dive in to that. Um, one thing that I think of when I think of black hair as resistance is always like 60s, 70s, the big yeah. fro, yeah, the yeah, pick yeah. with the yeah, yeah, black the power whole, thing. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking yes. about. Got a couple of those. Well, mm-hmm. used to. Mm-hmm. Back when I had That's an afro. Keep your afro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, I keep them around just, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to leave the floor open if anyone else had any, like, comments on just, in general, like, the politics around black hair. I literally just saw a statistic that was, like, over 50% of black mothers had to get reports because of their kids' hair from mm. schools. Wow. That's Dang. crazy. Yeah, that's awful. Um, No, most of mine, I'm thinking about work and black hair in the workspace. And I'm thinking, like, about my own experiences, but also just some of the stats that are around also. Um, And, yeah, I think think it's just, it's, the language, the political aspect is really interesting because it it, it is politicized. And we're going to talk about a little bit about the actual political acts surrounding that. Mm -hmm. Um, But then also when you, you know, bring in the idea of race being political and our identity Mm -hmm. being political, then in that way it is too. And so thinking about how, you know, I think it's like over 40% of black women feel like they have to straighten their hair to get Mm -hmm. a job. Yeah. 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 (laughs) I know I have felt that pressure. Um, And I think, I think if you have curly hair in the workplace, um, as opposed to straight hair, you're like twice as likely to experience microaggressions. Mm. And I know for a fact, I grew up with boys telling me that I was more attractive when my hair was straighter. Wow. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I'm an adult now. I can see that and recognize that. But just the fact that that messaging starts so young and people think it's a compliment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I actually forgotten all about that. But, yes, I remember that as young as elementary school. Mm-hmm. People talking about like, oh, you gotta wear it back in a ponytail. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. girl, my hair does back. not do that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> what are you yeah, talking yeah. about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember being in high school when I first went natural, mm-hmm. and I cut off all my permed hair, and yep. people literally li- were like, "Why did you do this? Yes, yeah. yes. How could you? Like, you looked so much better." Mm-hmm. I remember just feeling so insecure mm-hmm. with the hair that naturally grew that out, of out of my head because people were literally questioning my decision. Why did you do this? Why would you sacrifice your beauty in this way? Mm-hmm. And I really was like, oh my gosh, did I just sacrifice my beauty? Yeah. But it actually grew and I felt more beautiful in the hair that naturally grew out of my head. Yeah. 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 I love my hair. Same. Same. And I've al- I think I've always felt that way even in like knowing that that's not necessarily the way other people perceived it. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, I love my little beads and my braids as a kid. I will say, um, I never loved the braid backs, you know. The, the cornrows? Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry for me. funny shape head or something? Yeah. Is it that forehead? It's a whole lot of forehead <laughs> happening. Forehead. There is a whole lot of forehead <laughs> happening. But, okay, um, this is not an episode about my forehead. So let's get into some of these stories that I have instead. <laughs> So you mentioned that around 50% of black mothers report having received um, calls from school. And so we had something specifically about that. I think there's a lot to be said, obviously, if that's something 50% of black mothers um, can report out. So I just had a few anecdotes here from 2017 up until uh, 2022. So we start with a charter school in Boston issuing multiple um, detentions to black 15-year-olds who were wearing their hair in braided extensions, mm-hmm. saying that it doesn't follow the dress code. Mm-hmm. So we all know there's a lot of sex and gender bias associated with the dress codes in general. Mm-hmm. There's also this racial element as well. I'm sure we all very much know that. Mm-hmm. In 2018, we have a referee in New Jersey who forced a 16-year-old mixed-race wrestler to cut his dreadlocks or forfeit his match. I remember, yeah. I remember this story too. coming out. Yeah. I also remember, this isn't on here, but I remember seeing stories of young children, multiple stories actually, of young children who were elementary school age, um, maybe even one or two like preschool age, like four-year-olds, who had their teachers actually cut their hair yeah, that's in right. school. I that's remember right. this. Yeah. I'm sorry, but as a mother, I would be livid. Oh, yeah. Livid. Oh, yeah. I don't think there I would be suing. say on the record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there would be a lot of, a lot of words. I don't want to go on the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I remember being that. a kid. I remember there were a few moments of being excluded from like, f- like field day activities because the helmet wouldn't fit mm. over my hair. Yeah. Mm. I remember current being constant struggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> current struggle too. Even with Seriously. biking, we yeah. were talking about that. I remember being in classes in college 
um, even with my own family, I grew up mostly with the white side of my family and like, Lord help them, they didn't really know how to deal mm-hmm. with my hair. Yeah. My mom did, but the rest of them didn't. And they didn't understand that the language they were using was harmful. Mm-hmm. And so I was constantly Pinky. told. Nappy. 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 That one, mm-hmm. ooh, I bristle at that one. White people sometimes get real comfortable with that word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have lots of strong memories of like my family, my grandparents, you know, loving people, being like, mm, can you tone your hair down? It's a bit much. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is. It's so what comes out of my head. Yeah, <laughs> like, I just am this. This is way. just this me. Is... <laughs> like, yeah. The it's bigger the big hair, gosh. the closer to God. Mm. Stop playing with me. Mm. But also, <laughs> what we learned in science. I know this might be a little early, but what we learned in science recently. It was a doctor, uh, Tina Lasisi's yes. recent. We're, we're saying your name, your name right. right. Yes, I hope we are. Doctor Tina Lasisi's recent research came out about how black hair, like the coarser and curlier your hair the more protected your scalp is from solar radiation. Mm -hmm. And also it helps with the wicking of the sweat from the scalp. Mm -hmm. So you are literally made to be in these beautiful, warm, hot environments and your hair literally protects you Mm -hmm. from harmful radiation. I will um, say the one time I've ever been sunscreened was on my scalp. Um, and I had, did, right? mm-hmm. yes, I, did, I fell asleep yes. in the sun. <laughs> yup, yup. <laughs> it's crazy though, because there are all of these anecdotes of people literally having their hair cut off, going to detention because of their hair, mm-hmm. not being able to do all of these things because of their hair. And a whole lot, this was 2023, 2022, mm-hmm. PNAS, a top journal mm-hmm. in biomedical sciences, published a paper talking about how your curly hair Mm -hmm. is protective of solar radiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but that really like, it really pulls at my little heartstrings (laughs) because it's just like, it's only been validating the hair that we've been trying to wear as ourselves Mm -hmm. for generations that's only been negatively perceived Mm -hmm. by well, yeah, and it comes down to the the language. I love it. Yeah. I don't love it. Professionalism, right? Mm. And when you think about the kind of forced assimilation that often happens with people of color, or people of any marginalized culture, assimilation just means adopting like a really boring, dominant culture. Come on now. Just like come in, be quiet. Don't don't make any yeah. waves. So therefore, like don't do anything colorful. Don't do anything loud. Don't be unique. Don't be yeah. an individual. And when it comes to our hair, especially in predominantly white spaces, it doesn't matter how you wear it. Yep. You're always going to stick out. And that was the lesson that took me a really long time to learn, especially in grad school. I kept thinking, maybe if I wore it this way, maybe if I wore it that way, yeah. I would feel more involved. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm black. Exactly. Yeah, right? can't, we talk about like, these kids being kicked out of school for their locks or their dreads. And like at the end of the day, that's essentially the same style that is the predominant style, right? It's yeah down, it's mm-hmm. straight, it's stretched. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I That's even think so of, you know, we don't have to get into a debate about this, but even, you know, the Oscars, the slap, right? Mm-hmm. Like that was centered around black women's hair and yeah. like a conversation mm-hmm. yeah. about yeah. what's real. appropriate, how we're, um, how we're perceived yeah. and the way that our hair impacts the way that, that folks see us yeah. for better or worse. And to your point, can't win, you know, yeah. nope. cut it all off and yeah. still be the center wow. of mm-hmm. someone's controversy. Yeah. I remember when I was in, I think it was high school, um, high school undergrad, to your point about this professionalism. Mm-hmm. Someone was like, oh, wow, I love your Afro. I wish I could wear my hair like that, but my boss wouldn't let me. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, why is that the perceived notion? Why are you accepting of that notion Mm -hmm. that you can't wear your hair how you desire to or in its most natural Mm -hmm. form because it's not seen as perfect? What is professionalism? Mm. Assimilation. It's assimilation. So we talked about, um, you mentioned you were perming your hair at some point and you cut it off. And I think that that's even another thing that we talk about is not only like, being forced to assimilate into these roles, but like the toll that it takes, right? Yeah. So like you're applying heat to your hair, yeah. killing the chemical it, relaxants, it. Yeah. The which chemical are linked re- to cancers. Exactly, yeah. that's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah, exactly. You know, these chemical relaxers that, um, you know, essentially black women have passed down like these traditions of relaxing our hair mm-hmm. over the generations. You know, you can go back and see the ads for it from like the 50s, the yeah. 60s and so on and so forth to this day knowing now that those things are carcinogenic, right? Mm -hmm. That we're literally killing ourselves to fit into these spaces um, in order to show up in a way that is not natural Mm -hmm. to us, right? Um, So 
one of the things that we did want to bring into this conversation is that there is a movement um, against that. And it's called the Create a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair Act, or the Crown Act. Um, and that is really addressing these sort of like disparities among black women in the workspace mm -hmm. um, and for these black students too. I had another anecdote here about a public elementary school in suburban Atlanta that put up pictures of children to say like, these are the inappropriate styles to wear your hair. Oh so imagine, you know, you're showing up at school with a photo of someone who looks like you in front of you and being told like, this is the wrong way mm -hmm. that's to be. So counterproductive to empowering these youth. I remember mm. with Feel the Kids, we had a whole natural hair lunch and learn where mm. we came in, we targeted young women of color um, in this it was like an elementary middle school. And the goal was to talk about natural hair, mm -hmm. talk about why your natural hair is important, why it's beautiful, why you should have pride in it. There was a couple of girls, mind you, these are kids. Mm -hmm. This one girl was like, I actually do natural hair. And we're like, oh, well, maybe you can help such and such do their hair as well. Just <laughs> trying to help them learn about how to do their hair, how to take care of their hair, but ultimately have pride in pride. who they are and yeah. empower them to recognize that your hair is beautiful, mm -hmm. no matter what the outside noises are saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have seen that also as a trend on TikTok with black women educators yeah. who will show up at school and do their students' That's hair right. for them. That. Right. And I really love that, like infusing that sense of pride in how you look and how you show up into a place. Um, I mean, it's crazy how important hair is to just a black woman, a black non-binary person, a person of color mm. who has curly hair, right? I remember at the elementary middle school that we were leading this program at, one of the biggest things that the um, facilitator talked to me about was that literally little girls would not come to school because their hair wouldn't be done. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, can you imagine missing out on education because your hair's not done? Mm -hmm. Honestly, I could. Yeah, I had a, there was a friend's house I would sleep at in elementary school and her mom had no idea how to do my hair in the mornings. And those were the mornings where I'd throw a fit and I didn't want to go to school the next day. She would do this, <laughs> she didn't know how to do it. She didn't know how to brush it. You know, she tried to brush it dry, do all this different stuff. And she would do these twists on the side, make me look like George Washington. Oh, no. I was devastated and that's all she knew how to do. And like, bless her heart, like she tried. My mom never like, I don't think my mom actually tried to teach her anything. But like, it is such a point of before my makeup, before my outfit, before anything else, how am I gonna wear my hair? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How am I gonna do it? In the back trying to figure <laughs> out my hair, like yeah. Yeah. how long we've been recording? How am I gonna do it? <laughs> and even like, especially, I mean, especially being around like my people, of course they can tell, but it almost becomes an issue, especially when you're moving in a lot of like white spaces where it's like, because I'm we're so few represented, I almost feel this pressure to like, put on this like, yes, this is my hair. No, you can't talk about it unless it's a compliment. And yes, it looks fly. Yeah, <laughs> like, honestly. You have to speak it yeah. out loud constantly. Yeah. And this thing that I think we keep coming back to is that these traumas and this expectation begins for us as children, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so coming back to the Crown Act, you did mention a few statistics. So something like yeah. you said over half of black women feel that they have to straighten their hair mm -hmm. in order to be perceived as professional. Mm -hmm. wow. And then I, I saw another statistic that said 20% of black women are sent home because of their hair mm -hmm. and they're two and a half times more likely um, for their hair to be seen as unprofessional, mm -hmm. which means that the 50% of black women who feel like they have to straighten their hair mm -hmm. are right. Yes. If two and a half, <laughs> yes. they're two and a half times more likely to be seen That's as unprofessional. Right. Yeah. Like, so it, it's this thing where it's like, is it the wrong thing? Mm. Yes. But in our actual reality, it is, what's it is the truth. It's yeah. what's happening. Yeah. Um, so we talked about the Crown, the Crown Act. Um, so just wanted to name some of the folks who worked on that. Mm -hmm. So we have Bonnie Watson, Corey Brooker, um, Ayanna Presley, Barbara Lee, and Marsha Fudge were some of the legislators who helped to put this forth. And you were mentioning that that's something that's like new where you're living, right? Yeah, so it's really interesting that they're passing these on a state-by-state -state basis. And you can go on their website and see which states have passed. And it's so new that this isn't even on the website yet, but it's recently passed in Texas, wow. which is really fascinating, right? Like a lot of non-progressive things do get passed, progressive things don't get passed in Texas. So it's really interesting, but there is a strong black population. The thing about the Crown Act, it kind of goes back to exactly what you're saying in that it makes it illegal to discriminate based on hair. Mm. 
But just because it's illegal doesn't mean it won't happen. Yep. This is a first step and this is very necessary. Thank you, elders. But also, <laughs> like, this doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And yeah. just like that in Texas, I know some cities, some areas are going to be great. I'm in there. I'm in Austin. I'm in one of the most progressive places. And still people are weird about my hair. Yeah. And so it doesn't yeah. Have y'all ever everything. experienced any, like, weird hair interactions during grad school or just throughout your lives as feminists? I mean, there's, you know, the part where this isn't as much hair, but this one just always makes me laugh. I was at a conference. Two black women were there, me and this other woman. She was dark skinned and was straightening her hair. I had a natural afro and people still confused us. <gasps> still. I do, she was also much older than me. It was fascinating. Um, but on the hair point, uh, I've been in classrooms, told my hair is distracting if I sit in the front. People can't see the board, mm -hmm. which is wild to me. <laughs> I, you really you really can't see the board? And you just make an excuse. But no one, I don't know if anyone ever complained. It was a professor who told me. Um, no, and I've also been told by other people that like certain hairstyles are more professional for conferences mm. than other. And honestly, what hurts the most is it, a lot of times it comes from, from your own. Yeah. And they're trying to look out for us, but it hurts. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they're just feeding into the assimilation mindset. Right. Yeah, they yeah. think that they're trying to promote professionalism. Yeah. And statistically speaking, they maybe are helping me in getting a job, yeah. but they're not helping me in changing the culture. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's a distinction. What about you? Um, I can't say that I've had too many negative experiences around my hair. I've definitely had like a range of hair experiences or hairstyles. Um, and it it is just... Interesting how it's always something that someone mentions. Uh -huh. um, so I can definitely say as a kid, you know, the beads were a little loud sometimes. <laughs> I definitely remember some conversations with my mom and the teachers around that. Um, but even as an adult, you know, I, I wore my hair in box braids with beads, um, you know, to the lab once. And, you know, someone commented. And it was it was wonderful as a compliment. Sure. Like, oh, I, I always wished I could do that with mine. <laughs> um yeah, and for a while at the beginning of grad school, I actually cut my hair. Mm -hmm. So I had a like undercut, you know, fade on the sides and still natural on the top. And I remember coming in um, the day after I'd like essentially cut all my hair off uh, and and other students, you know, commenting on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's 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 such a way that like I I think that there are very few and very specific cultures that have such right. like identity tied so closely mm -hmm. to hair mm -hmm. in just the way that it grows out of your head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're obviously all black women here talking about our hair, but I did want to mention too, I'd recently seen um, some TikToks. We had a story on here about like a student in 2022 who was excluded from their graduation because of their hair, a black student. But I've also noticed that that happens with a lot of uh, native and indigenous men mm -hmm. who have long right. hair yeah. specifically right. for graduation. Yeah. And so I saw this TikTok and like, God bless the Gen Zers <laughs> and generation alphas who like can make a joke out of all their trauma. Yeah. But I was watching this, this video of these high school graduates and college graduates who were um, young native men with long hair who were wearing wigs to graduation. Yeah. Wow. So that they could walk Except and not have to cut their hair. Yeah. Right. They put it all up under, you know, just a little. Yeah. So you've got these men walking around in toupees just so that they can be accepted into their ceremonies to to, to acknowledge the accomplishments that they've already done. Right. The hair didn't stop them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It reminds me of like, it's it's funny because it's part of the culture in so many ways, in both cultures or in all cultures, that care a lot about hair. It's like a bonding moment of getting yeah. your hair done. It's a sense of identity. It's honestly sometimes a sense of renewal. Yeah. Like, like this is my new chapter for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. This is the energy I'm serving. Mm -hmm. I'm getting it braided down because I'm in the lab. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. you do things that are, are beautiful and reflective of your culture. And then we turn around and we, and we go to spaces like, okay, I have to sidebar. Sackness. Okay. I went to my first Sackness conference, um, the ND STEM, National Diversity in STEM conference. And when I come, when I came back from that and everyone asks how it is, the first thing I tell them before anything else is, it was so amazing. I've never seen so much diversity in hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the white people are always like, oh, ha, 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 ha. Like, okay, cool. But all the people of color are like, 
Oh, oh my, my God, gosh. really? <laughs> like, that sounds so nice. Like, people out there with full braids and afros and indigenous braids with decor and feather, like, things yeah. in their hair. Yeah. And no one is questioning for a moment, are they qualified to be here? Yeah. Are they a good scientist? Yeah. Are they good at their job? It's just, you can be your full self with the hair. Yeah. But in so many other spaces, we can't. What about you? Have you had any interesting professional experience? I already know the answer to this question, but... <laughs> You know, I gotta ask for everybody else. Geraldine, oh. talk, to, talk to us. So it's really funny how you said such so many interesting, diverse experiences with their hair, because I am that person, okay? Mm -hmm. Low-key, my hair is different every other week, um, especially true during grad school, especially true during the pandemic. While we were out of, um, out of the lab, I got into the hobby of making wigs. Mm -hmm. So I made, like, a bunch of different Afro wigs. Also, at this time, I was... Um, just transitioning into my dreadlock phase. So I was like, oh, well, let me start making wigs so that when my dreadlocks are really, really tiny, I can just plop a wig on. You gotta put up some pictures of that <laughs> for, <laughs> you know, on screen. So I had this red wig that I used to wear all the time in lab. Now, let's be real, was it given Sideshow Bob? Maybe a little bit, okay? <laughs> um, she was big, she was red, loved her. Let's call her Genevieve. Mm. I remember wearing Genevieve to lab one day, and there was another um, scientist in the lab who, I guess at a point, had red hair. And I remember them walking up to me and them, like, touching, like, mind you, this is, like, full-blown mm. panorama. We are still wearing masks. <laughs> and, yes, I'm going to keep calling it panorama. <laughs> um, I remember her walking up to me and being like, oh my gosh, I used to have an afro just like this. And I mm. like froze because I was just like, I can't believe this lady just touched my hair. Mm. I can't believe this lady just, mm. I can't believe we in a pandemic and this lady just touched my hair. And I was just like, it's really inappropriate for you to do this. Like not only are we in a pandemic, it's just really inappropriate for you to touch my hair. Mm. Um, and I just also remember just feeling so uncomfortable um, because I'm like, you didn't have an afro just like this. <laughs> yeah, I know you didn't. <laughs> uh, you had wavy hair. Mm -hmm. um, these are curls. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you had, but it was not an afro just like this. So it just, it made me honestly feel unco really uncomfortable. Like it really made the relationship that we had really different. I just, I was uncomfortable. Yeah. I was in an uncomfortable space. And honestly, I remember kind of like talking about it to you, to other people, to you guys, to other people who had just had similar experiences and honestly like thinking back to it I don't, I don't want I don't want to call it traumatic but it was just it was uncomfortable and mm -hmm. I was just like I don't like this mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like this at all um and it's interesting because now like I literally said I change my hair all the time I get anxiety now sometimes mm -hmm. from changing my hair I'm like not in grad school anymore obviously but I'm in a professional workspace but because black hair is often the topic of conversation mm -hmm. it's like Sure, you can comment on my hair, but I don't want to have a whole nope. full-blown conversation with you. With, yeah. oh my gosh, what did you do to your hair? Why is it so different? What did it like? Did you cut it? Why is it shorter? It? Why, Why is it longer? longer? Yeah. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. I actually don't really want to have those conversations. But every single time that I change my hair, because I am the minority um, of my company, of any place that I'm in, people really ask. in the biotech in, in ecosystem, people will ask. People wow. will look. People will comment and mm -hmm. sometimes it's nice but most times I'm just like I don't be talking about your hair you can just be like oh nice hairstyle mm -hmm. leave it at that that's it that's, that's enough. all that's enough that's enough yeah yeah that reminds got me a little hot um... <laughs> a little heated <laughs> it's okay <laughs> I'm so sorry please proceed <laughs> my goodness we'll have to put the name on screen maybe afterwards but I cannot remember and I don't want to mispronounce her mm -hmm. last name but I have um, another friend and colleague she is a professor at Brown and also a rapper. Mm. And oh. her stage name is Samus, Dr. Nongo. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. yeah. So I, she has a song and she's talking about like braiding her hair in the song and then like showing up at work. And I just, I, I always remember the line. She's talking about how she wears about six packs <laughs> and how she goes in the work, into the workplace. Like they act like, oh, like who is this? Like different hair. So I don't know you, she rhymes. Six packs where you appear to know no blacks. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And they're just like, ooh, that's a real one. I mean, but there's this girl that I know I went to undergrad with. Literally every single time she changes her hairstyle, mm. people act like she's a brand new person. Like that's they actually the are like, oh, hello. Me. I don't know you. So really? You Seriously. haven't taken a single moment to like absorb who I am you guys forget beyond that? that? We all look the we same. All look the same. Apparently. It doesn't matter your shade, your texture, your your bone structure, nothing. We're all the same. Listen, we all got dreadlocks. We could easily be mistaken <laughs> for the same person. We can't throw some glasses on. You never we're know. All the same. <laughs> but I really loved your point about the beauty of like the diversity of hairstyles mm -hmm. at Sackness. Um, and to your point about Texas, I have a friend who um, works in a hair salon and she's done that work for about six years. She was in Dallas. Mm. And recently she visited me um, up in Baltimore. And I remember we were just out in a restaurant and she was like wide eyed looking around like, it is not like this in Dallas. Everyone looks exactly the same. Mm. She's in Dallas, she's like, everyone comes into the hair salon, they get the same cut, the yeah. same color, <laughs> same color. and yeah. they would walk into a place like this and have a heart attack yeah. at just yeah. how different yeah. everyone looks yeah. from each other right. alone. And I, I think that that was like very interesting experience, like watch someone else have, especially when that's sort of our norm in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but you know, it, want, it really brings me to a place where I kind of want to like transition we talked about all of the ways that like maybe our hair has been weaponized against us, mm -hmm. but I think there's also a lot of room for talking about um, pride in black mm -hmm. hair yeah. and like the work that we actually put in yeah. to maintain it. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that maybe non-black folks or folks who don't know a lot of black people can truly appreciate is like how much work goes into mm -hmm. our hair. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's I sometimes when I'm in a mood, I call it an inequitable, like, <laughs> cost. <laughs> like, it's an inequity. Like, how many white women need to go get their hair done before a conference? Like, yeah. how many white women need to get braids or retwists or whatever ever so every so often? And some of that, I think, is born out of, again, that professionalism. Like, I can't go to the conference with frizzy head, which you could if it was more acceptable, mm -hmm. but it isn't, even though there are some people... Go I, I can't tell you how many men I've seen at a conference their back of their head is still messed up from the bed. <laughs> like, I can tell you just rolled out and I'm out here under under the limelight. Um, oh, I just lost my point. <laughs> what were we talking Not about? the back of the head, the, the work that goes into it. Oh, the work that goes into it. <laughs> so, Some yeah, people don't be putting in no work. It, yeah, I used to call it an equitable, equitable cost, but now that I'm older and I've like figured things out, it's now definitely way more of a point of pride. Yeah. It's like, no, I do need to stay home all day today and work on my hair. It brings me back to myself. Yeah. I don't always do it, maybe not as often as I should, mm -hmm. but it brings me back to myself. It makes me feel like you see the effort, like the input, if you really take yeah. care of it, you see it pay off in the long run. And it really does feel like a, a form of self-expression. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I definitely relate to that. and. Oof, the point about learning to do it too, like that's a yeah. whole process as well. Mm -hmm. But something that gets passed down to us yeah. also from like our elders, right? Mm -hmm. I always think of myself as a young kid trying, like when my mom was like, you gotta learn to start doing some of this on your own. <laughs> um, and I, I wore my hair straight up through high school and it wasn't until I got to undergrad that I really was learning how to deal with my natural curls. Um, and up until that point I had been um, heat, heat treated. Yeah. So silk press every couple weeks, like that kind of thing. Um, and really learning to do my hair on my own. I was like that one, it, it, this might be pre TikTok days. I think this might've been a vine. <laughs> uh, the video lives on, the, the video where it's like, shot through like the crack of the bathroom door and it's like a little white girl, she's brushing her hair in front of the mirror, but like sobbing. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was me <laughs> learning yes. to yes. do my hair. Um, and yeah, whether it's like a re wash day mm. is an evolution. Mm -hmm. okay. People yeah. people sometimes are just like, I don't know how you have the arm strength to just have your your hands How up else there. did she get sculpted? Okay. That, that's all this is. This <laughs> is just <laughs> for wash day. I don't day. work out, it's just, just the your hair. hair. The biceps are literally just wash day. Yeah. I can't tell you the last time I lifted anything other than my arms into my scalp. <laughs> Honestly, that's why I'm so grateful to have so many sisters. Mm. And my mom, like I, I could get away with getting like 36 inch braids because my mom or my sister was doing it. So Oof. I didn't necessarily need to pay two, three, four, five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much people are paying these days. We're losing the recipes on that one. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm forever grateful for my mom and sister. Literally, we'd be sitting in the kitchen for hours and they'd just be 
doing my hair and it just was a it was also a bonding moment like, yeah I get to sit with my mama and we would laugh and she would pat my hand every time I tried to touch <laughs> mm-hmm. it but we'd be in the kitchen and yeah. we'd be cooking <laughs> up the hairstyle for me it was a little bit of a journey into like loving my blackness especially mm-hmm. growing up in a white space yeah my, again my mom loved and cared for my hair but I didn't live with my mom all my childhood I moved in with other family and and the first hair person that they took me to put a brush in it and was like I can't handle this this is too unruly you need to get it relaxed and it was from that point on that I just relaxed it to death Mm -hmm. I mean I literally fought with people at the salon they're like well we're not going to apply the you know they only apply to the roots I'm like "Mm, apply to the ends apply to the whole thing Mm -hmm. I can't I can't do this and it was just this huge, long journey of mm-hmm. like self-acceptance and love, eventually cutting it off, going natural, shaving it for a minute because that was it was all too much. Yeah. But really, I think, yes, wash day is a transformation, but it's <laughs> also like it really does feel like a returning to like self-love and self-care yeah. and like really believing in your body and your mind and spirit being like kind of woven into one if we're getting a little... Like the great Spiritual. India Ari said, I am not my hair. I am the soul that lives within. Yes. Yes. Your yes. point about your sisters and your mom with your hair, it really is just like such a point of community to, you know, I think about my grandma or my aunts or my mom braiding my hair as a kid, you know, get the hot, get the comb, come <laughs> sit down on the floor in front of them. Hang out. Um, but also even with Vanguard STEM, so I won't like name the folks just, you know, I didn't run this anecdote by, but one of my like, really like communal memories of Vanguard STEM was being at a conference. And I think we were debriefing from the day and going over um, our plans for the next day. And one of the members of the team was like sitting on the floor and the other person pulled out their little Falcon tube from the lab (laughs) with their hair oil in it and was oiling the other person's scalp as we were debriefing from the day. Um, You know, I've been, we've been where we've shown up at conferences and somebody had their hair in like two strand twists. It was like, okay, somebody come help me with my tooth twist out in the the bathroom, yeah. That was definitely me at the last Agnes conference Mm -hmm. we went to. I was taking out my uh, twist out. Mm -hmm. Come on, Ariana. Mm -hmm. So just these moments of community too and and how like our hair and that part of our our culture really like infuses itself into, into in all those ways. I want to segue into what I think you're going to segue in. So one of the things that I was realizing just in this conversation was my hair was one of the first times I started experimenting, like feeling like a little scientist, mm-hmm. you know, like trying different products and different orders, making your own products, yes. doing, you know, the, the deep conditioning things with heat, without heat. Mm-hmm. It was the first time that I really felt like I had ownership of something of a science experiment and I got to test it over a long period of time. Yeah. I'm just realizing that. Ooh, I, that just gave me flashback to all the coconut oils and stuff in the bathroom <laughs> mixing mess. chemicals. Oh, this this yeah. reminds me of when I had a friend from undergrad. Her name is Brie Hall. She was using Eco Styler gel mm-hmm. and she like mm-hmm. canceled Eco Styler gel because she's like, look at all of these negative things, the negative chemicals that this gel actually has. She started creating her own gel using flax seeds. That's amazing. Yeah. And so it's just, there's all of these black women that are empowered to create hair products. Shout out to Madam C.J. Walker, the first black woman to become a millionaire. And it was all off of creating black products Mm -hmm. or products for black women hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's really an interesting conversation to be had is like, in some ways we're all cosmetic chemist, yeah. at least a I little see. bit. Yeah. Yeah. On wash day, we all turn into some cosmetic chemists. Black you know? them. Exactly. That's right. We didn't talk about that. So we know Madam C.J. Walker, yeah. mm-hmm. and I think that the point that you made about her being the first black woman millionaire is even greater than like the accolades that we can give Madam C.J. Walker herself is also like this recognition of a need in your community. And I think mm-hmm. that there are a lot of black women innovators who are recognizing those needs in their yeah. communities. I know I have an aunt, her name is Abna Brew, and she has her little, um, excuse me, not little. <laughs> <laughs> My, her, her name is Abna Brew, and she she has a hair company called Hair Brew. Yeah. And part of her reason for starting that was that she works as a cosmetic chemist and pitched it to her company. And they were like, why would we do, mm. like, why would we be worried about black women's hair? Mm. And so she went out and did that herself, and it's now become like a lucrative field for her. And I know that you. Yeah, that's really, that's not only my aunt, she, uh, her name is Funlaya Alabi, she has a skin and a skincare line called Shea Radiance, but my cousins and my aunt also have this other hair care 
skincare line called Hair Growth Co., mm. where they have these really, really simple hair oils and shampoos. They literally will never change the price. It's always $10, but it, like, legitimately works. Mm. And the little reason that they started doing it was because they had already been using it in their family. Mm. So it was something that they had been using from time and time again. Everyone's hair is growing beautifully and strong. Why not share it with the world to help empower the natural grow of hair? Yeah. yeah, and we even funded a project through Hot Science Summer yes. with yes. Um, AJ a day, and mm -hmm. so she's not focused in hair specifically, but she's looking at skincare formulations yeah. and how the difference in pigment and melanin in your skin impacts the difference in your need for um, your like specific uh, oh, wow. skincare products. Yeah, wow. and kind of to yeah. that point, my even my aunt that created Shea Radiant, she did it because her kids had different types of skin conditions, eczema, for yeah. example, dry skin. So how can we think about using Shea Butter that she gets from Nigeria and actually helps employ different black women in Nigeria and mm. across Africa to actually help the skin products that we are she's developing for her kids and for other black people. That's amazing. And it's so important too, because I feel like we've, we've had conversations before about how like skin conditions and hair conditions in particular affect black communities. Yeah. We were talking about alopecia earlier. Mm -hmm. I know psoriasis and eczema yeah. are like ramp rampant through these communities. And I feel like it's partially, you know, some sociopolitical analysis could be done on like the environments and the water and all that mm -hmm. in these communities, but also just the availability and products. Yeah. I used to spend so much money on organic whatever, blah, blah, blah products. And honestly, most of it, could not compare to the things either I made at home or truly some of my best products are black made like small shop products and yep. they're phenomenal. Yep. Yeah. There's one uh, company I wanted to highlight specifically. So Rebundle, they're the black women who have developed the plant-based braiding hair. Oh, wow. And we were talking about the incredible. skin specifically. Yeah, so so that was what prompted them. So apparently one in three women who use synthetic hair mm. uh, experience some sort of irritation. And of course, I'm you just those people. Those people yeah. Yeah. So you just spoke about like the differences in eczema, psoriasis and, and things like years. that. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, right here, the stats are running themselves. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, rebundled. I saw this a few years ago, actually. And I think at that point you could pre-order and they were already sold out. Wow. Look at how much there's a need. Exactly. Wow. And so these black women, they make plant-based braiding hair. It's made from banana fibers. Mm. So cool. And the idea is that they want to formulate these to match with textured hair and to eliminate that like irritation. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the, the skin is the largest organ in the body. Yeah. So that microbiome, like protecting that, there's a science to it. We're all talking about how we become cosmetic chemists and on wash day, but like this is why because mm -hmm. we're really it's it's part of our um, holistic well being. Mm -hmm. um, so I really I really want to touch on rebundled. Um, they are launching all sorts of products, colors, and things like that, and it's Black women founded and run, and I just love this idea that. From Madam C.J. Walker up until now, we have yeah. these black women, cosmetic chemists, who are not only innovating, but seeing the needs of their community mm -hmm. and, you know, leveraging that to, mm -hmm. to build, you know, their empires, more or less. Dang, that was deep. <laughs> yeah, I don't really, I, I mic drop, mic, I mean, <laughs> that's, it, like, that's it. You got close on that note. <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah, I think we just wanted to close out. Yeah, we talked about cosmetic chemist. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to touch back on Dr. Tina Lissasi, yeah. who you yes, brought up. Yes, yes. So if you haven't engaged with that work yet, so she's a biological anthropologist. And I believe her dissertation work was around like the science of curly hair in general. Mm -hmm. We talked about the UV protection. Um, and it's funny because you brought this up from the actual article yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I think I saw this on TikTok. <laughs> um, and it was, it was someone who was talking about another aspect of black hair, which is, we all know if you've ever picked out your fro, mm -hmm. you know, it's big, it's got a lot of volume, and then you go stand in the light, and it's like looking real sparse when the light shines yeah, through it. Yeah. And so one of the other things in that paper that was mentioned was that like even that is for like the air circulation mm -hmm. on your scalp to cool you, prevent those like headaches, you know, brain swelling, all that stuff that that can happen. And it's like truly it's amazing. I saw this video once of a of a guy on a motorcycle, which, you know, judge how you will, the risk taking there. Mm -hmm. um, he had dreadlocks mm -hmm. and he got in an accident mm -hmm. and his helmet was crushed and his some of his dreadlocks were his locks were like cut in half. But his 
brain in his head was saved by the wow. fact that he had all this dense hair wow. right back here. Like they wow. were literally cut and it, he hit like an edge of, I don't know, a car or something. Like it's not like it was a sharp edge. Um, and so it really does protect us in so many Seriously. ways. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So. That's crazy. There's so many folks that we could talk about. I think there's so many things we can touch on and folks can visit, you know, the rebundled site and read more about like the science behind that. Um, they can look at any of the cosmetic chemists who have their own lines yeah. that we reach out to. If you're struggling to take care of your curls, we drop we some gems. We got, got you. We got you. We're going to drop That's some right. resources. Uh, but don't ever hesitate to be your own scientist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we brought up some other like scientists who are working in the game and publishing. Mm -hmm. And so as we continue our Black Hair series throughout the month, we're going to like engage with some of those folks who oh, yeah. can share their expertise with us yeah. about yeah their hair, their technical expertise, yeah. and their lived experience. So follow us that. on social media so you can hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, follow us. We're at Vanguard STEM on everything. VanguardSTEM.com for long form content. Holler at us. We holler back. We holler back. <laughs> <laughs>